Milo Yiannopoulos, the controversial political activist and former Breitbart editor, is suing his former publisher for $10 million. Now, Milo claims that Simon & Schuster wrongfully and in bad faith cancelled his book deal and violated the contract following outrage from people who disagreed with his views. Now, Milo, who has never been a stranger to controversy, generated even more controversy after he appeared to defend sexual relationships between boys and older men. Yiannopoulos announced the lawsuit in front of the publisher's office in New York on Friday. Simon and Schuster say that the lawsuit is without merit. And he is here in studio to talk about his book. Milo Yiannopoulos, the author of the new book, Dangerous. Now, Dangerous is already sold out on Amazon. In fact, it was sold out hours within its release. Milo, thank you for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. So, Milo, uh, Let's cut to the chase. You were slated to speak at the RNC convention. You were certainly a, a rising star. And then uh, these uh, sexual relations with men and boys comments came out and, and seemed to sort of uh, derail your train a little bit. You address this issue first in the book, so let's just get it out there. Let's sure. get it out of the way. <laughs> What exactly happened? You say it was sloppy phrasing. So, yeah, so I mean, I give hours and hours and hours of interviews, and, and it was a late night, three hour, booze uh, fueled live stream on the internet, and something tumbled out of my mouth that I didn't intend. So, I, I apologize for that because I said something that I didn't mean. I was talking about a sensitive thing people don't like to talk about very much. I was talking about how. Um, young gay men sometimes form relationships with older men who kind of, you know, let them know it's so that their sexuality is okay, so if their home life is, 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 is tricky. Now, something that tumbled out of my mouth about their physical intimacy, which I did not intend, um, and I apologize for that. So I, th I think um, people have been very... One of the nice things about America is it's very forgiving, and yeah. people are always very happy to... If they understand that you didn't mean what you said, and you give a full account of it, and they know that you're sincere, they're very quick to forgive, and my book sales certainly suggest that America has forgiven. They certainly do, but of course you had uh, the leftist liberals pouncing mm -hmm. on that. That mm -hmm. was uh, their big get. Well, they've been waiting for me to slip up. Um, and actually, funnily enough, it wasn't the left that, uh, that did it at all. It was, it was the right. It was establishment well, Republicans. Well, you have enemies on both sides, that's I, for sure. Look, all the worst, Fans and enemies all across the, the spectrum. All the worst people in the world hate me. You know, very, very, very far right, very, very far left. Like, they all can't stand me, you know? Um, which tells me I'm doing something about right. And uh, anyway, so this, this CPAC conference, was a, it's, it's this right. sort of dorky political conference. Um, wouldn't have been a hugely big deal losing or keeping that. I mean, you know, it's, 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 you know, it's a few thousand people who are just obsessed with politics. So it's not really people I write for anyway. But um, Simon & Schuster took the opportunity to cancel my book deal over it. And I believe that that was pretextual um, because they said that it was, well, one day before, they said they were happy with the manuscript. They thought it was wonderful, thought it was great. It was going to do, it was going to do fine. They thought I'd done a really good job with it. And then 24 hours later, we got a uh, letter from them saying that it was suddenly unfit for publication. Well, it wasn't suddenly unfit for publication. Um, we believe that they breached the contract. Um, and that, you know, that did do me a little damage. I wouldn't say that it, it didn't derail my career, but it might have delayed things a little bit, you know? Um, and they have to pay for that. Well, the joke's on them, it seems, because you've already sold out. <laughs> I know. We, with, we are within printing. hours. We can't get it to retail as fast enough. You know, you we, know, we, and Simon & Schuster should have known that. And I think they probably did. But what they really did was cave to pressure from leftists, you know, cave to the protesters, cave to the boycotters, cave to the mob mentality, cave to people well, who were just being outraged for a living. why is this causing so much outrage, do you think? What is the political message that you hope to convey in the book that people are finding so terribly mm. offensive? Well, I think why the left finds me challenging and perhaps terrifying, but the re reason the left finds me dangerous uh, is that I kind of represent just by existing, you know, the, the sort of refutation of the two core things that hold uh, progressivism together. First of all is political correctness and, uh, you know, the, the idea that you, somebody somewhere knows better than I do what I should read, what I should say, what language I should use. Well, I don't think that's the case and I certainly don't think that university professors, journalists and Hollywood should be telling me what I can say and what jokes I can crack. And so I like to demonstrate, you know, through my college talks and in my books that you you can tell really outrageous jokes and guess what nobody dies you know it's just a joke and if you don't like it don't go listen to that guy in, in concert or you know at a, at a gig and the second thing which is the really which is the poison the rot right at the, you know in the heart of american progressivism is identity politics the idea that because you're a woman or because you're black or because you're gay you have to vote a certain way you have to believe a certain set of things and so in the book i very carefully try to dissect um the gay establishment feminism, Black Lives Matter, to demonstrate actually that right-thinking, sensible people who are capable of fact, logic, and reason 
very often do not end up on the left, you know, the side of things, and you shouldn't be pressurised into it just because you, you uh, because as a result of things you can't change about yourself. You know, you get born black, you don't have to vote Democrat, you know, you don't have to right. vote at all. So, they, and, and those two things are really important because they're what underpins progressivism in America, and I represent a threat to both of them, and I'm very, very effective, I'm very good at it. I have very big audiences. You, you know, certainly I, do, and, and, and you certainly do cause uh, a lot of people to come out and support you, and a lot of mm -hmm. people to come out and protest against you, mm -hmm. and you've been doing uh, these free speech tours at college campuses. Yeah. Many have banned you from even attending. <laughs> um, what does it say about the fact that now in America there seems mm -hmm. to be this complete resistance to alternative viewpoints? It seems to be that whether it's you or Ann Coulter or somebody else, there's a complete mm -hmm. intolerance to an alternative viewpoint. Why is that? Well, you mentioned Ann Coulter, and she, like me, is, is at least perceived as being quite hard right. Um, I don't think it's probably accurate in my case, but um, as, a, as a Brit, I came to America thinking this was going to be the land of freedom, you know, free expression. It's the land of the First Amendment, after all, you know. Um, and I discovered that actually the social pressures on speech, you know, what you can and cannot say in, in, in society, during dating, in the workplace, um, are some of the most restrictive speech codes I've encountered anywhere in the world. And, uh, you know, I don't have any particular love for the Republican Party. Um, I happen to be a conservative on most social issues. But uh, it's very clear that the trajectory of, you know, speech codes and, and, and language policing and the oppression of different points of view is working very obviously in one direction. And that is the progressive left, which has a stranglehold on the media, on the academy and on Hollywood, constantly characterizing conservative points of view as hateful and bigoted, sexist, racist, all the rest of it, and constricting not just the language that conservatives can use, but the ideas they're allowed to express and the subjects they're allowed to bring up. There's, you know, we now have this blanket consensus in the media about a total myth, the wage gap, you know, the idea that, that, that women earn less than men for the same work. It's just not true. It's complete myth. Um, but it goes all the way up to the White House. And bringing it up at work can get you fired. And it's a really weird circumstance, a really weird state of affairs for America of all places to be a country where speech is so heavily restricted. And it's well, normally the speech of conservatives. It's interesting because in your book, it seems like you, you champion the cause of the white straight male, which uh, has been, uh, well, basically getting a lot of pushback for being white, straight and male because nobody wants to hire them because it's not filling any sort of uh Quotas. <laughs> no, you don't get the um, I mean, I don't want to get. Yeah, I don't want us to get misled by the the white or the male or the straight bit. I'm not particularly invested in any part of a person's identity. But what I do do in the book is draw attention to the fact that the fabled straight white male of feminist and, and progressive mythology um, is the recipient of the kinds of language that would be totally unacceptable right. if it were directed at any other group. If you look at the way that feminists talk, some of the Black Lives Matters leader in, uh, the Black Lives Matters matter leaders in Toronto who talk about whiteness being a disease, being a defect, and white people being devils. This stuff is in the book as well. That kind of language, the poisonous, well, toxic, Milo, horrible you, language... You, you use language, and many people have accused you of hate speech, of hate mongering. I don't know what that is. Do you, so does the Supreme how would you Court, define hate speech? Do you agree with I that? I wouldn't, because there's no such thing, and the Supreme Court agrees with me. Um, you know, it's not, it's not a meaningful concept. Hate speech seems to mean anything that a liberal doesn't like, or a fact that a liberal can't rebut, or an opinion or a joke that a liberal finds offensive but can't fight on the merits. So you say, you'll bring something up about, you know, why people become feminists, or you'll make a joke about a particular group of people, as comedians have done since time immemorial, and if you attack one of the left's protected victim classes, it gets called hate speech. It's a meaningless term. Well, one of the groups that are particularly uh, combative against you is, uh, is Muslims. You have in a number of your speeches said that uh, Islam oppresses women and is an ex existential threat yeah. to homosexuals. Yes. Is, is, is that, some would say that's fact, some would say that's hate speech. Well, it's, of course it's fact. Of course it's a fact. Everywhere you find Islam, you find the systematic oppression of women and the, and the murder of homosexuals. And it's not just ISIS, it's not just terrorists, it's mainstream Muslim culture. And in 11 Muslim countries, I could be murdered for and being who I am. And when people say you know? Islam I mean, just, is a religion just, of peace. I laugh, you, as I think every other sensible person does. Well, one thing that, that we want to discuss is, do you feel that your approach dilutes your political message? You were kicked off Twitter yeah. for having that, uh, well... I had a spat with Leslie Jones. You had a spat with a Ghostbuster actress. <laughs> really, a small issue considering the bigger political message of, mm -hmm. of freedom of speech that, mm -hmm. that you're trying to bring out. 
Do you think that that takes away from it? No, because I think, and in the book I talk about the so-called debate club conservatives, you know, conservatives who are all, all about the, the policy debates, you know, the, the intricate details of TPP or, or whatever. That's obviously never going to be me. The observation I make in the book is that any successful political movement needs all kinds of different voices. You need the hell raisers to blow open the fire doors and to get people's attention. And then after that, people having had their minds open to this, oh, wow, you mean conservatives aren't all just hateful, crazy, wacky, like, you know, rednecks. Tell me more. Then I'm like a gateway drug, and I can feed people into George Will and to Thomas Sowell, uh, Thomas Sowell and all these other you know, great conservative academics and intellectuals, you know, if it's, if it's, if it's about feminism, Christina Hoff Summers, AI, you know, all, all manner of other people who are able to articulate things in a more perhaps uh, sober way than I choose to. But no movement has ever been successful with only hellraisers and trolls, and no movement has ever been successful with only dorks and debate clubbers. And I, the, 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 the function I perform, if you like, is grabbing people's attention in the first place in a, a public environment in which Conservatives are very often just bullied out of having a voice at all. Right. And if you look at, you know, the, the, if you look at the voting habits of, of journalists at all the major newspapers and all the major TV networks, if you look at the politics of university professors, if you look at the politics of Hollywood producers, directors, and actors, it's very clear that there is just a systemic institutional hatred of conservatives and a, a fundamental misunderstanding of what conservatives actually believe. And to, to get above all of that noise right. and that, that homogenous attitude, sometimes you have to be loud. Well, you certainly are loud, and you certainly. <laughs> Certainly are dangerous and uh, get the book. Milo Yiannopoulos, author of Dangerous, will be right back.